Hello and welcome to module 5.4. In this module, we're going to use what we've learned in the previous two videos and look at some examples of autonomous cold starts and assisted cold starts. Um, and to show how when a receiver starts up with no prior information, how it goes about searching the acquisition search space to find the signal. So we're going to begin with an autonomous cold start. So just to get these terms straight, cold start generally means the receiver has no prior information. It's actually not a strictly defined term in GPS. It's, it's just got a, a standard meaning, which means no orbit information, uh, does not know the time, and does not know where the satellite is as it starts up. Um, and autonomous means the receiver has, has no external assistance, like as the, as the opposite of assisted GPS. So let's, let's look at an example of an autonomous cold start. And we're going to start out with what is the rating of the TCXO. And we've assumed that the TCXO is rated by up to plus or minus 3 ppm, parts per million. And as part of the, the, the purpose of uh, this particular video is to show you how we've put into action the things we've learned in the previous videos about the search space and about assisted GPS, but also to show you real life values. And so where did this 3 ppm come from? Well, I just picked uh, an example of a TCXO, and, and here's the data sheet. And you see here they show you frequency stability over temperature in this data sheet, and there's our value, plus or minus 3 ppm. So that's where that value comes from. That's a typical value for a TCXO. And then for our example, I have, we have to make some assumptions on, on how many satellites are visible and how we're going to go about searching for them. So we assume there are eight satellites visible, and we're going to assume that the receiver is stationary when we look at particular values, but we're going to design a receiver that would work in a, in a, a typical consumer environment. So you'll even you, you'll see here that even though the receiver is stationary, we, we make some design choices here for a receiver that's not stationary. And so that, that's typical of how you would go about this. You have to design for some envelope of use cases and then test your design on, with some assumptions. And, and so that's the assumptions that we, we'll use. So, we, uh, so the next step we do is to make ourselves a table and and put in some values that we have to design for. And so here we get to use what we've learned in the previous few videos. So first of all, it's a cold start, so we have no idea where we are uh, or what the time is. So when we search for satellite Doppler, the satellite could be rising or setting, we, we don't know. And so we have to put up with the full range of satellite Dopplers, which we've seen before, is plus or minus 4.2 kilohertz. Uh, the TCXO offset we just talked about, and so 3 ppm scaled by 1.5 kilohertz gives us, or it's 1.575 kilohertz to be more precise, gives us this minus 4.725 to plus the same value for the TCXO offset. Then we have to make some assumption of, of how much speed are we designing for, and so uh, we, we choose 160 kilometers per hour, which is about 100 miles per hour, uh, as the maximum receiver velocity that we'll design for, and that's scaling as we've learned how to scale speed uh, to hertz, minus 0.23 to plus 0.23 kilohertz. And if we add those all up, it tells us that we have to search a range of minus 9.2 kilohertz to plus 9.2 kilohertz. And so that's our designed search range. Now, at this point, let's talk a little bit about the corners of the search envelope and about why we chose this number 160 kilometers per hour and does it mean that if someone used this receiver at 161 kilometers per hour they would not acquire any satellites well let's just talk about that for a minute well what this means is if you were traveling at 160 kilometers per hour in the direction of the satellite then you'd get a doppler error of 0.23 kilohertz and if you're traveling away from the satellite you get the opposite Number. And so you remember when we worked on the effect of receiver speed with respect to satellite Doppler, this, these worst cases were only when you're traveling towards the satellite. So first of all, you only get those worst cases if the satellite's directly aligned with your direction of travel. So this wouldn't affect all the satellites, it would only affect some of them. Moreover, if, 
if you were to hit this limit, it only will affect your, your Dopplers in your total search space if you happen to be right at the 9.2 kilohertz limit. So the satellite would have to be in line with you and either rising or setting, which, which is correlated, because if a satellite's in line with you, it's, it's close to the horizon. But you'd also have to be at the limit of your TCXO, which is not a correlated value. So, the, so, so that's why there's certain values like speed where it's reasonable to pick a, a common number, but, but some number that might be exceeded under some circumstances. Somebody might be driving faster than this. And you would expect that the receiver will still work because for, that, for this limit to trigger this limit would mean that all the other limits have to have reached their limit at the same time. And even if they did, it would mean that only that one particular satellite in line with you is now out of your search range, and you can still pick up all the other satellites in view. So this is an example of a soft limit. There are, there are other limits that are hard limits that you absolutely cannot violate. We'll see them uh, later. But this is an example of one that's a soft limit. So we can choose a number like 160 kilometers per hour. That's, that's quite large for consumer use in a car, but could be violated and still won't affect the design of our receiver. So those are, those are our choices for our design. And now we're going to put some, and, and so this was just a reminder of where that all came from. Uh, and so now we're going to put some actual values using uh, these assumptions that we made up here. We said there's eight satellites visible and that we're going to assume for our example that the receiver is stationary. And so now we'll put some actual values to see how our design works. So we'll say, OK, just for convenience, let's, let's organize those satellites so that the Dopplers are spaced like this. There's one satellite at minus 4 kilohertz, minus 2, minus 1, and so on, up to 4 kilohertz. And we'll assume that this particular TCXO that we're using could have been anywhere in this range, minus 4.7 to plus 4.7 kilohertz. We'll assume it's 3 kilohertz. And that for our particular example, we're stationary, so there's no Doppler from the user motion. And then the actual observed satellite frequency is going to be this this in the top line plus this on the bottom line. And so we get these numbers, minus 1 kilohertz to 7 kilohertz. So those are the actual Doppler values of the satellites in a particular example. So we put those up in the top left corner here. And, and, and then we look at what our frequency search space is going to look like. So here we have this two-dimensional search space, we're looking at that, that sync function from the top. And so you'll remember this was the thing that looked like the chessboard early on, where we've got frequency on one axis, and we've got this tau value uh, on, on the other axis from 0 to 10, 23 chips. And I've shown the chessboard empty because what I want to do is build it up and say, imagine you begin searching and, and see how it goes as you begin searching the space where you don't know where anything is yet. Now, we know some, some examples. We've picked some, some example values. But it's generally a bad idea. You could, you could take these example values and start to show them here. You could say minus 4 kilohertz. So we know there's a satellite here somewhere at minus 4. You could put it there. And we can, you could put all the satellites where they are. But if you do that before you start deciding how to search the space, it biases you because you know where the satellites are. So I like to start with a uh, blank slate and say, OK, we're just going to search in frequency. So where do we begin searching? We, we, the satellites could be anywhere. Remember, this is just our one example. Satellites could be anywhere in this range. Well, the best place to begin searching is right in the middle. And that's because you've got all these terms. Some, some are correlated with each other, but some are uncorrelated, like the TCXO offset is uncorrelated with where the satellite is in the sky. And so when you combine all these different variables that could be all kinds of different values. The, the most probable value is 0. For example, the most probable value of TCXO offset is indeed 0, because that's how they designed the TCXO to be something plus or minus some error. And even the satellite Doppler uh, tends to have a, a higher probability of being small, because you tend to see the high satellites more than you see the low ones, because the low ones get blocked by buildings and trees, etc. The low ones are the ones rising or setting with the highest Doppler, and the ones at zenith have no Doppler offset because they neither getting closer nor further from you. So starting your frequency search at 0 is the right thing to do. And then if you don't find anything, then you continue one bin to the right, one bin to the left, one bin to the right. So you search out from 0. And this is how we'll search this space. So we begin by searching up the middle. And you remember that we, we decided that a coherent interval of one millisecond 
was a sensible value and a frequency bin of plus or minus 250 hertz gave us, so frequency of that, those together gave us a maximum loss of 1 dB in any particular bin. And so what we're showing here is a bin of 500 hertz wide correspond. So 500 comes from this plus or minus 250. And so now we're searching in a bin that's the same width as the bin we analyzed in the previous video. So we search up the middle and we find nothing because we, if we go look back at our satellite Dopplers, there are no Dopplers at zero offset. And, and now you might say, but hang on, I, I see one there. But that's the satellite itself. What we actually receive what we actually see is the combination of the effect of the satellite Doppler, our velocity, which we've assumed zero, and the TCXO offset. So if you look at the actual offset values, there's nothing at zero, so there's no satellite there in the middle. So that's what actually would happen. We'd search up that middle bin and find nothing. And so then we'd, then we'd start to search one to the right, one to the left. And when we got to one kilohertz, out here, we'd find ourselves a satellite. And that would be the first satellite we find. So that's great. We found one satellite. And uh, if we typically, we would be doing this in parallel on multiple channels. And in each channel, we'd be searching like this. And one of the channels would find this satellite. And the, the other channels could carry on searching in the same way. However, we can do something more at this stage. And that's hinted at by this gray line down here. So what, what is that about? Well. Once we've found a particular satellite, we, it tells us something about where all the other satellites could be. Because we, we know that this plus or minus 9.2 kilohertz is the total search range. And that comes about by adding up the maximum satellite Doppler, the TCXO offset, and the receiver velocity. And so now that we've found one satellite, we know that the furthest difference any other satellite can be can, must be twice times the maximum satellite Doppler. That's this, so this, this whole range. It can, if, if this particular satellite we found was setting, the most different another satellite Doppler could be would be a rising satellite. So it would be 2 times 4.2 kilohertz away. And if we were driving straight towards the satellite at our maximum speed, the most different another satellite could be would be we were driving straight away from it. So there's the maximum speed in there. And that's as far away in Doppler as any other satellite could be because the TCXO offset is common to all satellites. We've only got one TCXO. And so whatever it is, we don't know what it is yet. We just found the satellite here. But whatever the TCXO offset is, we know that our search range now, now that we found a satellite here, we know that our search range now no longer goes out to minus 9.2 kilohertz. Rather, it goes out to this value limit, shifted over to the left by, by this amount. 2 times 4.2 kilohertz times plus 0.23 kilohertz. So that's just a little trick to reduce the search space as you go. And now we, we'd continue searching for the other satellite, one bin to the right, one bin to the left, and so on. And doing that for a while, we would eventually find that satellite at 1 kilohertz. We'd find that one at minus 1 kilohertz. We'd find that one at 2. And we'd find this one at 3. And, and, we, and as we found each one, you notice that these gray lines on the side move, steadily move in. So, that if we don't, so as we keep searching, we don't have to waste our time searching to regions where no satellite Dopplers could be, as we just explained. Uh, but typically, you would not get out there if you were out in the open. If, in this case, we're assuming you're out in the open. Each satellite that's available, we see. And once you've got four satellites, you can generally begin to navigate and actually work out where you are and then work out what the Doppler of the other satellites must be. And you don't have to continue uh, this, this search in this way. And so that's what an autonomous cold start would generally look like. So now let's con contrast that with an assisted cold start. And so in the top right here, i am just put this picture just to remind you of what an assisted cold start was. It was where we reduced the search space by knowing an initial position and what the time was, and then using that information to work out what the satellite Doppler should be. And so we can reduce how many frequencies 
we have to search. And so from these values that we just looked at in the previous uh, two videos, we can now go look at what our uh, contributors are to the frequency search space for an assisted case. So now, now let's, let's look what our, what our assumptions are. We've still got the same receiver. Uh, and remember we said it, we assumed it had a 3 ppm TCXO. But because it, we're doing, dealing with an assisted case, remember that we discussed how the TCXO can be calibrated by the cell tower that you're communicating with. And so even though it's a 3 ppm TCXO, we know that it's been calibrated to plus or minus 100 ppb. We still have eight satellites visible, but now we have assisted time to within plus or minus two seconds from the cell tower, and we know our position to within three kilometers from the cell tower. And so, so now what search space do we have to search? Well, just applying these values for each two seconds of time, we have plus or minus 1.6 hertz. For each three kilometers of position, we have plus or minus three hertz. For 100 ppb of error, we have 100 ppb or 157 hertz, 157.5 hertz. Uh, for the receiver speed, remember we, our design parameter was 160 kilometers per hour, and now because the receiver speed also affects the calibration of the oscillator, we have to put in a times two here, so we have to search over 468 hertz, possible effect of receiver speed, and those are the, all the errors that contribute to the width of those two lines and how much we have to search over there. And so we add that all up, it comes to plus or minus 630 hertz. So remember, we, just in the previous slide, we were talking about 9.2 kilohertz. So, so without changing the receiver itself, just by providing the information of assisted GPS, we've reduced that search space down to 0.63 kilohertz, which is 15 times better. So we've got 15 times less frequencies to search. That's the first thing to notice. And the other thing to notice is look how bigger contributor the speed of the receiver was compared to everything else. 74% of that search space is now dominated by the speed of the receiver. So if you weren't moving, or, or if you were moving slowly, the, the Doppler that you search for is, is going to be almost right, right away. And the, and the errors, plus or minus, mostly come from receiver speed. And you'll notice most of the rest uh, comes from the reference frequency. And the, the effect of the initial position and time is less than 1% of the total search space. So that's some interesting numbers to uh, keep in mind. And so what this then looks like when we, so when we compare it to before, so what I'm showing you here in the top right is the frequency bins that we searched. These were the first one, two, three, four frequency bins that we searched in the autonomous mode before we found that first satellite. And when we do this with assisted GPS, we don't begin searching at zero frequency offset. We begin searching where we know or where we expect the, the satellite Doppler to be. And so that frequency bin is really now maps to this frequency bin. And we still, I've, I've expanded the scale here. This is 250 hertz, which is the same value as here. But we, we don't have to search over the whole plus or minus 9.2 kilohertz range now. We just search this middle range. And if we we're not moving, then we'd find that satellite right away, very close to the expected frequency uh, that we looked for it. And if we, so that would be the first bin we searched. And if we didn't find it there, we'd search bin two and search bin three to find it. And so that cor corresponds to whether we were stationary. If we're stationary, we find it in the middle of the spin. And if we were moving one way, we'd find it over here. And if we were moving the other way, we'd find it over here. But keep in mind, just because you were moving doesn't mean you'd have to go to this other frequency bin. Remember that 75% of that search space was taken up as because of the speed that you might incur in the receiver. And so to be out here on the edge, you'd have to be moving at uh, 100 miles per hour, 160 kilometers per hour. So even if you were moving at a moderate speed, you'd, you'd, you'd be here or here. And so you'd still pick up that satellite in the very first bin you search. And so you'd find that satellite almost instantly. And now we add one more piece of information, which is that typical modern receivers can search an entire frequency bin in, at once. You can search all of this space in parallel. And so what does that mean for us? Well, the, so the conclusions are, if we have a modern receiver 
in autonomous mode, it's going to take several seconds to search the search space, because remember, we had to search. So several seconds corresponds to searching out here and out here, as we just saw in a previous slide. And that's before we even find the signal. And once we found the signal, to be able to work out where that satellite is in space, we have to decode the ephemeris. And what you learned before in uh, the previous model module with Professor Enger was it takes at least 30 seconds for an ephemeris to repeat its transmission. And so the best you can hope for is that you would decode the ephemeris in about 30 seconds. And if in that time you pass under an overpass because you're driving in a car, or you walk past a, a tree or something, and you lose one just one bit of the ephemeris, you have to wait 30 seconds for that bit to be transmitted again. So it takes tends to take multiples of 30 seconds before you decode the ephemeris from the satellite and find out where that satellite is in space, which is a necessary piece of information before you can work out where you are on Earth. So the net result is that in autonomous, an autonomous cold start takes an order of minutes, or one minute or two minutes. And if you've ever played with a, a hiking receiver that's not connected to the internet or to the cellular network, you might have experienced this, that you switch it on and have to wait a minute or more for it to get a position. And, and this is the explanation for that. Now, let's contrast with assisted GPS. With assisted GPS, it's a lot of the time, most of the time, you'll find the signal within a second. And that was because, as we showed here, uh, if, if you were stationary or even moving at a moderate speed, you would find that signal in this bin right away. And in the worst case, it would take up to three seconds to find the signal. And then it, with assisted GPS, it's not necessary to decode the ephemeris at all because the ephemeris is part of the assistance information provided to the receiver. So the receiver has that before it even begins looking for the signal. And so the time to fix is of the order of one second. And so that's the big difference between assisted GPS and autonomous GPS, that you can find the signal quicker. And what we're going to see in the next video is, is how we can integrate longer and achieve much more sensitivity as well.